purposes of starting uh, this session. Um, and let me do a couple of things that I omitted to do at the beginning last time. Uh, one is just to, is to mention that uh, as to both the previous topic, mergers, and, and as to nuclear power, I have a, a fair-sized library and a couple of papers that I've done my, myself. And if there's any interest in uh, any of those, um, just let me know, email or, or otherwise, and I will uh, get them off to you. The, the, the only one I've done on mergers is in the spring issue of the NRRI uh, quarterly and does lay out in more detail the concept of getting ahead, how states can get ahead of the curve. Um, with regard to uh, nuclear power, I want to drop back and, and uh, as I did at the last session, reminisce for a moment on the conditions when I first came to this program in the summer of 1974. Uh, at that time, the Atomic Energy Commission had just forecast two years previously that in order to avoid serious power shortages by the end of the century, i.e. three years from now, um, the United States was going to need to have a thousand nuclear reactors, uh, many of them in what were euphemistically called nuclear parks. Um, where they would be grouped in sets of eight or ten around a <coughs> fuel reprocessing plant, which would in turn, which would take the spent fuel, reprocess it, extract the plutonium, and convert that into fuel for a fast breeder reactor, which would also be part of these complexes, so that uh, essentially the parks were the renewable energy vision of 1972, that is, uh, they would produce more fuel than they consumed um, and would assure the success of what President Nixon in his final years called Project Independence. That was an effort to make the United States energy supply basically independent of the Middle East. Uh, worthy goals, but obviously at some variance with reality as it, uh, as it later unfolded. Um, about five years later, Harry Trebbing invited me back to uh, give a talk here, probably because it was a few months after Three Mile Island, and I was then on the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and uh, um, he wanted some explanations. And <laughs> It, uh, as it happened, there had recently been an ad in the Wall Street Journal which featured Edward Teller, who was uh, um, at that time still a fairly active spokesman for, uh, on, on nuclear issues. Um, and the headline of this advertisement was, I was the only casualty of Three Mile Island accompanied by a picture of Dr. Teller. And he made this claim because he had suffered a heart attack that spring, which he attributed to having to work 18 hours a day to counter the misinformation being put out by the likes of Ralph Nader and Jane Fonda about the significance of Three Mile Island. Um, and the ad went on to uh, state his concern that if nuclear power didn't prosper and the public didn't get behind it, uh, despite the jolt that Three Mile Island had provided, that his young grandson would grow up under communism in the United States. Um, uh, as Dave Barry would uh, say in his humor column, I'm not making this up. Uh, the, uh, um, the ad was said at the bottom that it was sponsored by Dresser Industries. Uh, and that jogged my memory a bit. And I went back and looked through some of the records relating to the Three Mile Island accident. And sure enough, it had been a dresser valve that stuck open on top of a 
pressurizer at Three Mile Island, letting all the steam out and exposing the uh, reactor core. Um, and so I wrote a little note to the Wall Street Journal in which the ad appeared, because the ad had contained an invitation to people the right to dress their industries and learn more about the company. And I suggested that perhaps Dr. Teller should take them up on uh, their invitation, because if he had, he would have learned that it was their valve that had caused him so much trouble. Um, the result of that was a demand by Dresser Industries, or actually a demand by six or eight congressmen for my removal from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission for having, <laughs> for having shown bias against their, uh, their favorite technology. It was communicated in the form of letters to the president uh, saying that I was obviously far too biased to remain in this important position. But one of the congressional offices that sent this letter forwarded backup material. And included in the backup material were the instructions written by Dresser Industries to its employees as to how to write letters to a congressman demanding the, the removal of an NRC commissioner. <laughs> um, so we factored that. Of course, we sent copies of that back by way of reply to uh, all of the congressmen who were um, ostensibly uh, acting on behalf of the concerned publics in, in their states. Uh, I tell these stories, I suppose, in part just because I enjoy remembering them, but also because uh, it's, it's worth, as background, to talking about where nuclear power is today to remember where it was within not such recent memory in terms of the expectations that, at least with regard to the Atomic Energy Commission projections, people were putting forth in maybe too much exuberance, but I have no reason to doubt good faith. Uh, and the tone of the ads that could be sponsored as recently as, as 1979 uh, with regard to Three Mile Island, granted that they seemed a little overstated and a little ludicrous even at the time, but still, uh, by today's standards, they, uh, they really sound like something out of a distant mythology. Um, and one reason, of course, that it's worth keeping that in mind is just by way of illustrating the extent to which energy policy realities, energy policy projections, energy policy considerations can change over a quarter of a century. Uh, it's not to say that I seriously think that the people sitting in this room in the year 2020 uh, will be um, enmeshed in deep discussions of how to get those thousand reactors uh, and those nuclear parks back after all. Um, but the pendulum does have a way of swinging pretty widely. And sensible energy policy has to at least allow for the possibility that what seem pretty firmly entrenched uh, trend lines out of the last decade or so um, could, on the strength of one good war in the Middle East or continued pressures over <coughs> uh, the realities of global warming and the impacts of fossil fuels thereon, swing round again. And, uh, so as we talk about nuclear power situation today, I wouldn't advocate doing it with the certainty that the pendulum was going to swing back, but it wouldn't be all that smart to do it with 100% assurance that it wouldn't either. Um, well, what is the, the current status of nuclear power? We've got not a 1,000 power plants, but I don't know, I've lost count with the closures. It was a little over 100, maybe it's a little under 100 now. Um, operating in the US, no reprocessing plants, no breeder reactors. Uh, about a dozen have closed in the last four years. Uh, but we still have more operating nuclear power in the US than any other country. Uh, and it still represents 15 to 20 percent 
of our generating capacity, and a lot more than that in the regions uh, that are heavily committed to it, the Northeast, um, Illinois, the TVA region. Uh, so it's still a very important part of the current U.S. power supply picture. Um, there are no new plants, of course, on the horizon. The last plant under construction, I think, was uh, completed a year or two ago, uh, and all the others have now been canceled. None, in fact, that were <clears throat> ordered after 1975 were completed, and none at all were ordered after about 1978. Um, internationally, the picture is a little different. There are still plants being built, in, uh, but at a much slower pace than previously in uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, and the Chinese have indicated an intention to go forward with some nuclear construction. The, uh, there have been announcements in the last three or four months of quite large commitments to nuclear power in Indonesia and in Kazakhstan, but it's hard to know just what to make of those. It's, they echo similar announcements uh, from other <coughs> countries in years past that have never really led to, uh, to major nuclear programs and or indeed to nuclear programs at all. And the rough rule of thumb that seems to reflect the realities of the world nuclear market now is that uh, there's a possibility of nuclear expansion only in countries uh, that are not in any way co committed to competitive electric power supply markets and that don't have uh, access to pipeline gas. Usually countries that are somewhat totalitarian also in their, uh, in their governments. Um, so I wouldn't bet on either the Kazakh or the uh, Indonesian plants coming to fruition, certainly not at nearly the announced levels, because both those countries do have alternative uh, fuel sources. On the other hand, the island countries that don't uh, and that have serious security problems may still find nuclear attractive, and there are a bunch of plants that are somewhere between half and three quarters finished in the former Soviet Union, uh, and for that matter, well, in the former Soviet Union, particularly in Russia that were, where construction was suspended after Three Mile Island and where there's at least some possibility that uh, given that the plants are half finished or more, that the construction will pick up and continue. Uh, yeah? You mentioned something about the processing plants were never built. Is there a danger of uh, third world Yeah, the history of reprocessing is sort of a fast, oh, I need to repeat the question? Yeah. The question was, uh, with regard to the reprocessing technology that the U.S. has chosen not to pursue, is there a danger of third world countries uh, undertaking uh, their own ventures into reprocessing? And I take it your question is really about whether they'll separate the plutonium, which is usable in, in weapons. Um, the reason why President Ford originally canceled the, withdrew the U.S. support for reprocessing internationally, and then President Carter actually canceled the uh, commitment even to the domestic plants, some of which were built in Barnwell and Morris in Illinois and West Valley in New York. West Valley, Valley actually even reprocessed some fuel. But uh, <clears throat> following the the change in national policy for just that reason, the concern that if reprocessing technology spread, uh, the international safeguards just weren't adequate to detect the diversion of you know, a chunk of plutonium about the size of a basketball or less that would be very significant for bomb making uh, was uh, just undetectable in international safeguards terms. Um, and that has remained a concern. However, as the economics of reprocessing have shifted, that is, with fewer reactors than were expected and more uranium found all over the world, uh, 
it really is economically makes no sense to reprocess fuel anymore. The concerns about running out of uranium just don't exist. So a country, especially a relatively poor third world country, that announces that it is committed to reprocessing is pretty well telling the world that it's committed to a good deal more mischief than that. And, and uh, so there haven't been expansions of reprocessing uh, technologies outside of the countries that, that still do reprocess in some years that I'm aware of. And I think some of the countries that were committed, India comes to mind, has, have really not done much of it in recent years. The, uh, the Japanese uh, have been sending a lot of fuel to Europe for reprocessing. The French, the British uh, do it and send it back, um, or send the plutonium back. They have the right to send the waste back also, but they haven't done that. Uh, and it doesn't seem to be a technology that's, uh, that's likely to go anywhere on economic grounds uh, in, uh, in the, uh, any time soon. Um, but it does, the, the danger is still what it was, that uh, if, sep if plutonium separated from the radioactive waste is legitimately in international commerce, <clears throat> there's really no acceptable in terms of cost or intrusion in national sovereignty, acceptable safeguard system that could possibly keep track of amounts that, that could be very troublesome. So uh, it, 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 it's still a, a problem technology for all the same reasons that it was when the US backed away from it in the late 70s. Uh, Probably the only continuing significance of that story outside of the uh, uh, concerns about weapons proliferation are that the expectations of the older nuclear power plants in the US at the time they were designed and built was that the spent fuel from those plants would be sent to one or another of these reprocessing facilities after somewhere between six months somewhere between six months and a year after removal from the reactor. And therefore, that it wouldn't accumulate in the spent fuel pools for the decades that have in fact been the case. Um, the later power plants, the ones that came online in the late 70s, early 80s, were uh, designed with much larger spent fuel pools because it became clear that in fact they weren't going to be able to ship the spent fuel away. But <coughs> the older plants, uh, and indeed the, much of the discussion of a waste repository and the need for an interim waste repository today is driven by the space constraints at the older plants, have, that, have the problem that they do because they believed that uh, uh, their fuel would, would be taken away and reprocessed, and that that would basically also be the, the longer term solution to the waste problem. Um, the, uh, the, anyway, that's by way of background. The challenges that face nuclear power as it moves into, a, uh, into restructuring are a combination of carryovers from the historic concerns, plus the new ones brought about by uh, uh, competitive pressures. The fact is that nuclear power has been flunking market tests of various sorts since the late 70s, when <clears throat> it basically became clear that there were almost always going to be lower cost alternatives for a utility than starting a new nuclear plant. That is the last atmosphere in which nuclear power was able to pass, new nuclear power was able to pass a cost effectiveness test was when the price of oil in the late 70s, early 80s was still being projected 
to run upwards past $100 a barrel long before now. And the, the, uh, the cases uh, <clears throat> that permitted the continuation, for example, of Seabrook or Nine Mile Point in New York contained, if I remember rightly, high oil price forecast cases by, they didn't reach 1997, but by about 1994 or 5 of $150 a barrel. The mid cases were around 120 The low case oil price forecast was in the range of $90 a barrel. Um, and at that, the, uh, there was some question as to whether the Seabrooks, the Shorums, the, nine, the last group of power plants were still economic. Um, and of course, when the price of oil turned around and, and fell instead of rising, uh, the impact of those plants on, on rates was, uh, was pretty catastrophic. Um, that history matters now primarily in the context of nuclear power's role in the debate over stranded costs uh, because, of course, um, almost all of the sunk capital cost in the nuclear plants is stranded by any likely measure. And the, <clears throat> the only issue that, of nuclear cost today that has much life to it is whether the operating costs of the plants are competitive with uh, the uh, costs of power that can be procured elsewhere, either from other systems that are in surplus or even, it turns out, from uh, new uh, uh, combined cycle gas plants. My, my first acquaintance with that uh, came a few years ago in New York when we ordered the New York utilities to begin to use bidding systems uh, to procure new power supply. And they, in the late 80s, all basically set up auctions and said, we estimate that we'll need several hundred megawatts of capacity by some date in the mid-1990s. Who's prepared to supply it? And power was bid into those auctions from both Seabrook in New England and Limerick in, uh, in Pennsylvania. And in both cases, the, uh, the, bids, the, nuclear, the bids from the existing nuclear plants were not the low bids compared to bids from new, uh, new gas facilities. And that was at a point in time when the gas technologies had not, not evolved to the point that they have now in terms of very high efficiencies and low costs. Now, part of the problem was that the nuclear plant owners themselves didn't realize how much the market realities had changed, and they were seeking to recover a chunk of the sunk costs, too. So it wasn't really a fair test of operating costs alone. But today, uh, it does seem clear that uh, a number of nuclear plants can't beat uh, on a, their operating costs, especially when you consider the likelihood that new capital investment will be required in the future for reasons such as steam generator tube repairs, um, that their operating costs don't win out against new, uh, new gas facilities. So uh, nuclear power really is in uh, a position now in which the, the operation of a number of additional plants is somewhat in question. Now, of course, it's a, that's a dynamic situation. That is, as each plant closes in a particular reason, region, the <coughs> value of a kilowatt in that region goes up a bit. And uh, so the remaining plants are a greater likelihood of surviving. You can't, you can't assume on the basis of today's economics that every nuclear plant in New England uh, doesn't make it. Because if you close half of them, the other half are, are in a market in which their output is that much more valuable. Uh, at the same time, the Cost pressures that have come from this, the, the knowledge that nuclear power would have to face competition, have set in motion a substantial amount of reevaluation at the, uh, the nuclear power plants themselves with regard to their potential to contain costs. And it's, in its early stages, this is, has by and large been a healthy and a constructive process. That is, the, the costs of nuclear power in the U.S. have come down substantially in. Uh, the last five or six years, and at the same time, the output of the plants 
many of the plants, average average of the, uh, all the plants taken together had risen. So clearly in the early stages of this process, there was a constructive interplay between, on the one hand, uh, improving the safety of plant operations, and on the other hand, getting the costs down did not turn out to take greater expenditures to uh, improve safety. It turned out, in fact, that a number of the steps that lowered the cost of operation had the effect of improving safety, for example, by reducing the number of unplanned outages, so-called scrams, uh, companies found that the expenditures that, uh, uh, expenditures that achieved that result also made the plants safer because one of the least safe configurations for a plant to be in is, is during an unplanned uh, need to go, to go suddenly offline. And of course, at the same time, um, their ratings improved, their output improved, their efficiency improved. And by the same token, as they evaluated their staffing and their organizations and found ways to reduce costs, they also found, by and large, that they were reducing uh, some fairly cumbersome sets of procedures and paperwork that uh, they had thought were necessary to satisfy safety requirements but that, in fact, the requirements could still be met in more efficient ways with fewer layers of management and actually improved internal communications in the plant. So up to a point, the cost pressures and improved safety actually, somewhat paradoxically, uh, were in a win-win configuration. But it's also become clear in recent years uh, in some states, Connecticut uh, high on the list, that um, the cost pressures did not always play out so constructively, that as you would expect, uh, among the uh, entire fleet of, of, of nuclear managers, there were some who went after the costs in ways that whatever their the intentions were top management reverberated down through the companies in ways that led to uh, actions that clearly shouldn't have been taken, actions that clearly did suppress legitimate safety concerns. Yeah. I was curious about this cost savings due to police Now, by and large, not. Uh, the, the, oh, sorry, uh, the question was whether the, the personnel structures at the, at the power plants, uh, the ones that it was found to be possible to achieve savings um, by simple sign, were directly mandated by the NRC. And while there certainly are situations in which the NRC requirements lead to, to results in terms of personnel, the number of licensed operators that have to be present in the control room, the types of expertise that have to be available on site at all times, uh, <coughs> the capabilities of the security force. Uh, so there is an interplay between NRC regulations and personnel size. NRC regulations don't say you must have a workforce of this particular size. Uh, what had tended to happen in an era when the utilities were monopolies, didn't have to worry about cost pressures very much, was that there was a certainty within the utility management that expenses made in the name of meeting NRC requirements would be permitted to be passed through by the state commissions. It was the state commissions didn't have separate expertise to challenge those kinds of decisions. So unless a particular nuclear plant was um, reached to sort of highly visible outlier status in terms of costing a whole lot more per kilowatt hour, the state commission wasn't very likely to challenge a claim that a particular set of expenditures were necessary to meet NRC requirements. The utilities weren't real imaginative in finding ways to meet the, the standards in least cost uh, ways. They would just throw some more people at, at any given regulatory requirement. The utilities would probably also say that the NRC was pretty insensitive to costs in layering on 
the requirements. Uh, there may be some truth to that, too, although keep in mind that after the Three Mile Island reassessments, which did definitely raise the regulatory requirements on the whole industry, there then ensued 12 years of <coughs> nuclear regulatory commissioners appointed by two presidents who really were highly sympathetic to the, to the nuclear technology, Ronald Reagan and, and George Bush. Uh, and they weren't sending people in there with instructions to, to raise costs. In fact, they were sending people in with instructions to compress the costs. I know this because my own term lasted two years in the Reagan administration, uh, in the course of which his science advisor and secretary of energy one day told the Washington Post editorial board that they were going to turn nuclear energy's economics around by getting rid of the anti-nuclear activists on the NRC, um, which basically meant me. Uh, um, and, of course, in the fullness of time, they, they did that. Uh, and yet, nuclear costs went right on rising until the competitive pressures uh, a few years later really caused the industry itself to ask hard questions about whether there weren't less expensive ways to to meet the regulatory requirements. Um, the, uh, <clears throat> but in any case, this, it is clear now that there have been situations in which cost pressures have compromised the safety considerations. And that poses a considerable dilemma for both state regulators in the context of restructuring and for the Nuclear Regulatory Commission in the context of how it's going to regulate in a restructured environment, especially given that NRC budgets aren't likely to be increased uh, in this day and age. And since the budget comes from assessments on the industry, uh, it's hard to justify, hard to, the, the effect of increasing it in any case would be to further increase nuclear costs at a time when the technology is having uh, difficulties competing. So even there, there's this not so constructive feedback loop between safety and, and, uh, and nuclear costs. It's worth incidentally paying a moment's attention to what's happened in Great Britain during this period. Uh, the British, when they privatized a wholly government-owned electric system in the late 80s, announced that they would privatize their nuclear plants as well. That, that would be part of the uh, industry that would be sold to, the, um, to private investors. Uh, but as the day came closer, in 1989, when the sale was actually to take place, it became clear that there weren't any buyers, that the entire privatization would fail if uh, the generating sector that was to be privatized had to include the nuclear plants as well. So very much at the last minute, the British withdrew the nuclear plants from the privatization and kept them in government hands. That had other unfortunate consequences for the structure of their generating sector, which uh, put that to one side. Uh, over the next seven years, entirely in government hands, the British succeeded to an even greater extent than the U.S. nuclear industry did in cutting the costs of their nuclear generation. Now, that was in part because their nuclear industry had operated less efficiently than the U.S. industry had, that is, lower outputs and higher costs uh, until the late 80s. Um, but a year ago, in July of 1996, the British actually did succeed in privatizing the eight newest of their power plants, uh, seven of them gas-cooled reactors, which we don't have in the U.S., and one pressurized water reactor, which is <coughs> not unlike our designs. That is still, as far as I know, the only example of a situation in which private investors were found to buy uh, the, uh, to take over um, a company whose assets 
consisted uh, entirely of, of nuclear power plants. And because the British kept some of the liabilities associated with those plants in the government, it's hard to assess whether, as a privatization, they did much more than succeed in giving away their eight best plants to the private sector. But it remains an open question whether you can give away plants in this country uh, to uh, investors who don't presently have them. There have been a number of indications recently that other companies are interested in taking over the problem with their assets, but none of them have actually materialized in the form of uh, a successful <coughs> transaction. Pico uh, indicated an interest in buying, I think, 30% of Riverbend, and that fell through. They and Energy both indicated an interest in buying Main Yankee, but uh, both of those transactions have fallen through, and Main Yankee is now slated to be closed. Um, uh, but nevertheless, in Britain, the uh, privatization did go forward, and in the years since then, the stock of the uh, British energy has risen at about the same rate as the British stock market as a whole. <coughs> the ratings I've seen on British energy lack the exuberance of some of the other British generating companies, Power Gen and, and National Power, uh, where the investors continue to do very well, but they, they're not rated as below market either. So in terms of the argument about whether nuclear power plants can be privatized, what the terms are, whether they need to go in large groups to diversify the risk, the British example is kind of an interesting one. And, and uh, um, as I say, it's not clear that you can make any money by privatizing a plant, but it may be that you can, <coughs> at this point, at least succeed in, in uh, finding investors who will take it off your hands. Uh, well, I sort of moved away from the point at which I was on a while ago, namely the role of, of nuclear uh, in the debate over stranded costs. And I just wanted to say one more word about that, which is that in the states that are having to assess nuclear stranded costs as to whether or not they should be recovered, there's this <coughs> argument that is sometimes made, which if you asked me a month ago, I wouldn't have said it was worth addressing, but then I heard it made by a former chair of a large Midwestern commission to a group of serious people in Washington, so I guess I ought to at least uh, point it out. The argument goes to the effect that the utilities really do not, of their own free will, decide to build nuclear plants, that they that the government positions of the 1950s and 60s in favor of nuclear technology were as coercive as, say, the Public Utility Holding Company Act uh, was with regard to independent power production. And that therefore, really, these nuclear stranded costs uh, should have the same status in terms of debates over regulatory compact or uh, the cost uh, covering the toad of two companies as <coughs> a state-ordered DSM program or a state-ordered uh, uh, contract that, uh, to buy, say, well, I don't hate to pick on Connecticut, but the, the trash burning plants in uh, Connecticut are another fairly overpriced uh, um, resource. Uh, <coughs> and in making this argument, he actually began with the uh, fact or the allegation that in the days following the bombing of uh, Nagasaki, President Truman began to ruminate aloud how wonderful it would be to convert this energy source to peaceful uses. And the, the argument then ran through legislation that Albert Gore's father had introduced in the Senate in the mid-50s that threatened to set up a national public power corporation to develop nuclear power in the event that the private utilities moved too slowly. Um, and on through uh, various reports issued by the Federal Power Commission and the Atomic Energy Commission in the 60s and 70s. And it's fair enough to say, and I would certainly agree, that the federal government was supportive of nuclear energy in that era. Uh, 
But to take the next steps and to say that this support led to, uh, essentially led to coercion, uh, is really just to ignore uh, a number of significant uh, aspects, such as what the alternatives were, such as the number of utilities that didn't go nuclear, um, such as the complete absence of any documents actually ordering any utility to, uh, to enter into nuclear construction. So with that having been said, uh, we propose to put that point aside and, and unless anyone wants to uh, pursue it further and talk a little more about uh, um, other aspects of nuclear power's dilemma at the moment. Uh, one of which is the question of what types of uh, management structures are likely to be most effective, both for further improving the economic competitiveness of nuclear power and for uh, maximizing safety. Now, with regard to maximizing safety, just, just a, a precautionary statement on my part, uh, I think states probably are making a mistake if they venture much further into the safety area than trying to stay very much aware of what the NRC is doing, staying in communication with the NRC. Uh, if they take on safety judgments of their own, or if they take on the weight of saying, well, we better allow a little extra revenue to nuclear energy because otherwise the plants won't be safe, they're basically letting their restructuring, their sense of what their electric industry ought to look like, uh, be shaped by perceived needs of nuclear technology when it seems as though the process really ought to work the other way. That is, the nuclear future ought to be shaped more by uh, the state's sense of what its electric power industry ought to look like than the other way around. A couple of states have been drawn into allowing some nuclear costs to be treated essentially as stranded costs or at least as charges that should be attached to the system on a mandatory non-bypassable basis, California and Michigan actually. Uh, and um, I don't know to what extent that's a judgment about safety, to what extent it's a judgment about wanting to keep nuclear power in the mix for other reasons. Um, you can make a case that decommissioning, which is a, a bit of a special kind of cost, is a sunk cost after the plant is run for about a year. But you really can't make that case about future capital investments or future operating costs. Um, as to decommissioning, let me spend a minute on it. Uh, once a plant is irradiated, uh, once it's uh, been exposed to radioactivity for a year or so, the decommissioning costs go up somewhat over the next 29 or 39 years of its operating life, but not a whole lot. So the argument that uh, um, that future customers should only pay the costs associated with serving them uh, would point in the direction of suggesting that um, the price of nuclear generation in the future uh, doesn't need to carry additional decommissioning costs. I'm saying this poorly, but as long as, oh, let me try to illustrate it with particular numbers. If you believe that it will cost $300 million to decommission a particular nuclear plant, and that plant's been running for five years, that number isn't going to change much whether you shut the plant tomorrow or whether you run it for the next 25 years. So if you're separating the nuclear power plant into a separate generating company and you're wondering whether to permit the $300 million to be collected in the form of a wire charge or whether to assign it to the competitive market and, and make the generating company collect it, there's a pretty good case to be made for, for allowing it to be collected through the wires charge because it's not, in terms of resource allocation, 
it's not a, uh, a cost that will vary depending on whether or not customers choose to buy from that nuclear unit in the future. Um, now, there are some variable costs. You still want the utility under some pressure to choose to decommission as, as effectively and efficiently as possible. You may care some about what method of decommissioning they choose, but the fundamental the fact is that the, uh, once the plant is irradiated, the, the decommissioning, uh, the, co the costs of the particular method chosen aren't going to vary with future use. But that's the only nuclear cost as to which that's true. Um, let me say a word about spent fuel uh, in the context of restructuring and future costs. Um, presently, Nuclear power, nuclear power plants pay a cost of a tenth of a cent a kilowatt hour to the federal government to develop a waste repository. Uh, in theory, that should have built up a fund of 13 or 14 billion dollars by now. But in fact, something on the order of half of that money has been taken out of the fund and used to balance the budget uh, for a number of years now. And it's no longer that. First, this was done. Uh, with the understanding that it was a borrow of some sorts, but it seems over time we've evolved to the point where there's not a great likelihood that the federal government is likely to, uh, to pay it back. And so what is really going on in part is that nuclear power carries a special tax, its own private budget balancing tax, uh, that other energy sources don't carry. Um, and meanwhile, the repository uh, seems endlessly stalemated at Yucca Mountain in Nevada. And a number of states have entered into a lawsuit against uh, the Department of Energy saying that, I, as, as the law does provide, that on January 1 of next year, January 1 or January 30 of next year, the NRC, sorry, the DOE is responsible for taking title to the spent fuel and, in theory, at least, carting it off to the repository. But since the repository doesn't exist, that isn't going to happen. The states have succeeded in the first round of that suit, namely establishing that it is indeed DOE's responsibility to take title to the fuel. No one's exactly sure what that means uh, in terms of its practical effect. But the, uh, the uh, the Congress, meanwhile, has considered and passed legislation which the President vetoed last year and has indicated that he will again this year, the effect of which would be to mandate the construction of an interim repository. Uh, and the intent is, is clearly that it should be a short distance from the intended permanent repository in Nevada. Yeah. Yes, I mean, they have the title to it, but uh, they don't want the title to it. So, and, and since the and it's an odd time of ownership because the government is committed to taking title to it next year. So, well, in theory, yes, but to move it to France, you'd have to get an export license from the NRC, and you have to get the various permits you need to remove it from the reactor and get it to uh, the, whatever vessel was going to transport it to France. And the fact is you never get the export license because that actually was tried with regard to the spent fuel, lightly irradiated fuel from shore. Uh, Kojima in France wanted to reprocess it, I think, to establish a precedent for reprocessing U.S. spent fuel. And uh, the Long Island Power Authority, which had title to it, applied for a license, and all of the nuclear intervener groups who had been sort of slumbering since the late 70s on reprocessing uh, suddenly awoke and uh, filed petitions saying that they would intervene and oppose on the grounds we were talking about earlier. And the fuel wound up going to Philadelphia Electric. Uh, um, 
I, I just don't, I don't think there's a serious likelihood. And, uh, there is, <coughs> there is now some interest in using plutonium from the dismantled warheads in the conventional reactors, which raises some interesting questions. Uh, it may not be a bad idea for, uh, just in terms of getting the stuff that are less usable configuration that it's in now, but it does blur the line between weapons and power plants that the industry has always been pretty anxious to, to maintain in the past. Um, in any case, the, the difficult issue that's raised by the interim repository legislation, to me anyway, is along these lines. There isn't any clear proof that an interim repository is more cost effective than taking care of the fuel right where it is at the reactor sites. Uh, and there isn't any theoretical reason why the funds that are now in the uh, in the nuclear waste funds, including the funds that are being collected on a daily basis, couldn't go back to the uh, um, to the individual sites in the form of dry cask storage or <coughs> pool expansion or re-racking or whatever was needed to accommodate the spent fuel where it is. And I suspect that's cheaper than taking it out, moving it around to an interim repository, building the interim repository, and then ultimately moving it again uh, to the final repository. But politically, it does involve uh, going to communities that the remaining reactors and saying, guess what, despite the assurances given at the time the license was issued, you are now basically an interim repository for an indefinite period of time while we get this long-term repository sorted out. So politically, that's pretty unpalatable. And <clears throat> it might be hard to pass the interim repository legislation if everybody didn't have a sort of secret handshake understanding that that repository was going to be in poor old Nevada. That is, if, they were, if, the, if, if every state had an equal chance of, of getting the interim repository, that legislation might not be doing as well as it is. Uh, but in terms of pure economics, I suspect that those are the more logical solution is to keep it right where it is until, uh, uh, until we have a clearer idea of where it's going to go long term. Um, the uh, issues for state commissions to consider with regard to nuclear power, we've, 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 we've touched on a number of them anyway. Uh, the one that we haven't spent any time on uh, is the environmental implications of closing a significant, significant number of additional nuclear plants. Envir really not just environmental, but also uh, sort of resource diversity. Uh, that is, the increased um, burden on uh, <coughs> either, nat either natural gas or, or other fossil fuels. And also, in some regions, I think, reliability issues. Clearly, the problems that Wisconsin and Illinois have experienced uh, over the uh, over recent months, have been affected by the shutdowns, uh, mostly on, in Commonwealth Edison systems, but also uh, at Point Beach and Kiwani in Wisconsin. Now, these are all watch list related, almost all watch list related, or other safety concern related shutdowns. Um, but they do illustrate that if you take a lot of nuclear capacity offline in some parts of the country without having first made provision for its replacement. Um, there are parts of the country where the transmission system at, at present is not adequate to permit the imports needed to, uh, to allow you to get by with that in, in, an ex in exceptionally hot weather. Uh, and so that has to be part of the equation as well. But the larger dilemma to me is, uh, lies in terms of uh, what the value of nuclear power is, of the existing nuclear plants is, with regard to concerns like global warming uh, and concerns like 
the <coughs> potential impact of burning more coal in the Midwest on air quality in the Northeast. It's a parochial concern of mine since uh, I live fairly high on a mountainside in New England. Um, the, uh, the British approached this in an interesting way. They, uh, when they discovered that they couldn't privatize the nuclear plants, and in fact, I guess even as part of the, the equation where they thought they were going to privatize them, they instituted what they called a non-fossil fuel levy. Uh, and the logic was that it was worth paying something extra for any fuel that did not either uh, produce substantial adverse air emissions consequences or come from the Middle East or in the unique political calculations of Great Britain, uh, given Margaret Thatcher's relationship with the uh, coal miners that did not come from coal either. So, for all those reasons, the conservative government was prepared to pay a premium to uh, any fuel that uh, was non-fossil in nature. But uh, I think to their surprise, um, this didn't really prop up nuclear power to the extent that they had thought that it would. Uh, and in any case, the levy is, is being terminated next year. What it did do was to lead to the construction of substantial additional renewable resources in Great Britain. But the real displacement of coal uh, that the Conservatives government had thought would come from nuclear power, in fact, came from uh, the uh, from new gas fires plants um, running on North Sea gas, but mostly taking advantage of the efficiencies that have come into that industry in recent years. So um, the, uh, in the British system, they, they took on this issue of uh, the desirability of, of having alternatives to fossil fuels by lumping together so-called green resources uh, and nuclear power. In theory, there's no reason why one wouldn't do that in this country. And in fact, it would probably be to the advantage of the renewable resources to do it. Because uh, while today in debates over federal legislation, the renewable resource proponents are pushing for a portfolio standard of something on the order of 2, 3, 4 percent of uh, national consumption being allocated to renewables. Nuclear power already has 15 or 20 percent. And so if the two were grouped together in an overall non-fossil package with the uh, provision that the percentage shouldn't fall from where it is now, chances are that renewables over time would have a much bigger pie to claim a piece of than is likely under the uh, proposals now being advocated. But I must say, politically, every time I've suggested that to a group that consisted of any significant uh, number of environmental groups, uh, I've been essentially uh, chastised strongly for suggesting that nuclear had any of the characteristics of a renewable uh, resource. And as I think just reflexively, the nuclear debate has left such a legacy of bitterness uh, in this country that however much sense it might make to uh, take some advantage of the benefits that the technology does offer. The benefits, that incidentally, were part of the reasons why it was licensed in the mid-70s. Um, it just isn't, uh, just isn't going to go anywhere. Uh, but it probably does still form part of the calculation that a state dedicated integrated resource planning needs to make with regard to the type of restructuring, the type of cost pressures that are imposed on, uh, on nuclear power in the future. One of the contexts in which that issue is going to arise for you is when you evaluate performance-based regulation. Um, and I say that because uh, if you look at what's happened in Maine 
over the last three years. Maine has in place now one of the stricter PBR plans, Central Maine Power does anyway, uh, in the country. Um, and it has had the effect of precluding the recovery of not only some of the losses associated with Maine Yankee's erratic operating record in the last couple of years, but also assuring that the costs needed to replace the steam generators uh, or to um, make some of the other uh, major modifications that would be necessary to keep the plant running need to be tested against the very firm caps that are in that PBR plant. And one of the reasons I think that Main Yankee is one of the plants closing, keep in mind that Main Yankee was, until about four years ago, considered to be a pretty good plant, whereas some of the other New England plants, which have far more troubled histories over the last decade or so, um, continue to uh, at least there's at least an open question as to what will happen to the Pilgrim, for example, uh, uh, comes to mind, is because CMT is under that PBR cap, whereas uh, the owners of some of the other plants are not under as clear-cut a regimen. Um, well, that's worth it. That's all well and good. The PBR plan has probably worked out pretty well for main customers. Uh, but it does indicate that performance-based regulation has impacts on, uh, on nuclear plants. And in Maine Yankee's case, I think there really wasn't much alternative to, to the closure. But what about the case of a plant that uh, is sort of bumping along close to competitive, um, maybe not doing too badly? Is it possible to design a PBR plan that has some specific nuclear targets in it. Uh, is it possible to use performance-based regulation to bring about more of the kinds of improvements that we were talking about earlier? I think the answer is almost certainly yes, that, uh, there, but that between establishing particular sort of productivity targets for the plant and establishing particular types of incentives and penalties for, for example, showing up on the NRC watch list or developing low, uh, lower, or for that matter, better NRC, what are called SALT, Systematic Evaluation of Licensee, sorry, Systematic Assessment of Licensee Performance Scores. Um, it should be possible to construct a mode within a performance-based regulatory plan that really might make a difference in the uh, in the performance of a nuclear plant within uh, within a state. Um, the uh, yes. Where would I place them? Uh, in terms of likelihood of continued uh, Before I give you anything resembling a direct answer, uh, um, let me tell you how I would urge thinking about a question like that. Um, one of the reasons nuclear power got into a lot of trouble uh, was that a relatively small community of people, the utility executives and the regulators, uh, federal and state, became too confident that they could answer that kind of question meaningfully, that they knew enough about the future uh, to uh, hazard pretty large sums of money on guesses about the, well, on their best estimates of the price of oil and how much it would cost to, uh, to finish the plant. And we've spent the last decade basically trying to construct systems for regulation and for resource procurement that rely less on whether or not a particular individual has the gift of prophecy and more on sort of flexibility, uh, um, 
risk reduction, sensible risk allocation between customers and investors. Uh, and so what would really matter to me if I were regulating in Connecticut would be to develop a, a regulatory framework in which regardless of what I thought the answer to that question was, uh, the people who have the greatest knowledge about it, about the plants, or, you know, the people who are running it, and the people who were putting out the money were the ones who were bearing a venture and share of, uh, of the risk that, it, that everyone's best guess was wrong. That the trouble system is the one that basically said, well, here's what I think the answer is, but in any case, the customers pay all the costs. Um, now, all of that having been said, uh, my guess is that at least one of those three plants is going to have a pretty hard time uh, uh, justifying continued operation, but um, that the combination of age, size, uh, is such that, uh, and, and the fact just the extent of the consolidation that's been going on in New England, um, is such that uh, the oldest of the three is um, certainly no better than an even that. Um, on the other hand, funny things are happening with the capacity market now. I mean, the New England electric system sort of broke with the rest of the industry, said it would divest its power plants, uh, and at least the rumors are that the bids that they're getting are quite a bit higher than anyone would have guessed. Uh, a few months ago, um, suggesting that the value of capacity in the Northeast and maybe elsewhere as well is quite a bit higher than underlay either the dire prophecies about stranded costs or the dire prophecies about whether the nuclear plants uh, would continue to be economic to operate. You don't, you don't have to change the value of a kilowatt or a kilowatt hour very much to bring uh, at least more of the nuclear plants into the fold of, uh, at, at which uh, they're likely to stay in operation. So at the moment, given those cost trends, I wouldn't bet against the other two. Um, at the very least, they're in this sort of odd stew with Pilgrim and Vermont Yankee. Uh, and. Uh, um, that you not only have to have some sense of how they're doing individually, but of, of how they stack up against the others. And Vermont Yankee is, I think, older than any of them, certainly smaller. On the other hand, it's run, it's also run by, um, I don't know, it's a long way around saying, uh, whatever I say, it's construct a system that, uh, which what I think doesn't matter. <laughs> The uh, one other point that I think is worth underlining is if I were in a state regulating a state commission with a substantial nuclear exposure right now, I'd care a lot about the quality of regulation at the NRC, um, including the extent to which there was a useful ongoing dialogue <coughs> between the NRC and state regulators so that each was aware of the leading concerns of the other. It's an area to which both sides of that community have always paid a fair amount of lip service, and yet there really hasn't uh, been um, a lot of meaningful communication. Yeah, they get together at NARU meetings. One of the NRC commissioners usually sits in uh, with the NARU Electric Committee. Um, but for example, uh, there hasn't been an NRC commissioner with any detailed familiarity with the economics of uh, the electric power industry and electric power restructuring at least since Ivan Sellin, who was George Bush's appointee as chairman, uh, left. And before him, there hadn't been for quite a few years also. Uh, 
So oh, it's, it's not a bad area for me to uh, pay some attention to in terms of urging appointments criteria on the administration. It's also not a bad thing for the commissioners among you to invite, to, to, to actually to ask when the NRC commissioners visit power plants in your state, which goes on a fair amount, that they check in with the, uh, uh, with the commission and maybe one of your commissioners goes along with them. It's a very healthy message for the nuclear licensee to get. You realize that the uh, federal regulator and the state regulator actually talk to each other because they, by and large, make an extensive practice of playing the two off against uh, one against the other. And the fact is, each one learns quite a lot when you do a uh, when you have an arrangement like that. The, the state regulators learn a lot about the, the technology in the NRC and, and uh, and vice versa. So those kinds of sort of small informal steps that uh, close the gap between state regulation and nuclear regulation are pretty important. Nuclear regulation also has a continuing importance to the economic side of restructuring because the NRC has to approve license transfers. Uh, and historically, that has not been very important, partly because there weren't many transfers and partly because the few that have taken place have been between regulated utilities. But the N one of the NRC criteria for these transfers is that anyone who holds a nuclear license or even a license to own a piece of a nuclear plant has to have financial qualifications. It's a requirement in the Atomic Energy Act. Um, and I forgot the exact rest of the way that sentence plays out, but basically has to be financially qualified to meet the obligations that are likely uh, uh, to befall them. Now, the NRC, about 15 years ago, went through a rulemaking and decreed that regulated utilities are, by definition, financially qualified uh, because the assumption was state regulators would always allow the necessary revenues, never mind the public services in New Hampshire. Uh, went through a bankruptcy process not, not long thereafter. But now in an era when the potential holders of, or owners of, of uh, shares in nuclear plants aren't necessarily regulated utilities, they may be generating companies uh, that are either unregulated or lightly regulated, they might be independent power producers. This NRC review process may be quite important in terms of potential divestiture arrangements, sort of <laughs> even uh, separation of ownership provisions. The NRC also has a continuing antitrust requirement, which is kind of like an appendix or a prehensile tail or something. It uh, doesn't have, hasn't had much significance for 10 or 12 years. I'm not even sure there's anybody still in those offices at the NRC. But it seems likely that before too much longer, during some effort to create a merger that uh, uh, some groups oppose on the grounds of its potential impacts on competition, someone's going to go back into the Atomic Energy Act and discover, lo and behold, that the nuclear power plant that's part of that merger is subject to a bunch of license conditions and statutory requirements relating to open access. And uh, that uh, may take on a, a renewed significance in, uh, in the years ahead as well. Well, I wanted to leave a few minutes for general discussion, any questions, any particular problems I haven't touched on. Yes. What's my It's been the case. It, it's been the case. The, the question was, what is the likelihood of life, of life extensions of plants when they reach the end of their uh, license lives, uh, and, and should otherwise be decommissioned? It's been the kiss of death for each plant that has announced that it was going to be the poster child for life extension. Uh, there have been, I think, <coughs> about six of them so far that have said we are going to seek life extension. 
every one of them has uh, been hit some kind of a safety or economic kind of and shut down. Uh, but the licenses were issued against an arbitrary uh, deadline. Um, in, and, in, and in fact, in some cases, where it took a long time to build and the license was key to the issuance of the construction permit rather than the operating license, I think there have been cases, or if not, there certainly will be, where the NRC has simply rolled the 30 or 40 year period forward to pick up the date where operation commenced rather than construction. But the more serious life extensions, where someone has wanted to come in and say, this plan is is nearing the end of its uh, license life and we're prepared to operate it for longer, have not happened. And uh, I think we're a few years away from knowing about the feasibility of them because I think what's still happening is that the plants that are coming up for coming anywhere near the end of their license lives continue to be the older, smaller ones. They're not as small as the original old or smaller ones, but they're still small enough that the economics of making the investments that are necessary to uh, extend the lives substantially are problematic because they're not spread over enough kilowatt hours to, uh, to make them competitive. And it's not till the, probably early in the next century that the first thousand megawatt plants, uh, maybe even later than that, actually, because Maine Yankee was, if I remember rightly, license for 2008, so, and that's still an 800 megawatt plant, so it may, it, it may be another 10 or 12 years before anyone really tests, uh, tests life extension, but the licenses are drawn to an arbitrary date, so it really, uh, the decision to test, to do a life extension, is really one that's based, I think, on a calculation about the, the future electric market much more than it is about the legal difficulties of extending uh, the license. That is, it's, it's going to be real hard to argue that the, that the safety parameters of the plant change substantially in year 31 versus year 30. There may be an issue over how long an extension they can get. Uh, but what's been feeding them up to now has been the fact that the economics of extending the small plants have been unfavorable. Plus, some of them have come up against particular age-related issues, like whether the pressure vessel is aging more rapidly than, uh, uh, than was contemplated. And that's a safety issue that applies to some, but not all, of the, of the existing fleet of plants. So, uh, eventually, a big plant that doesn't have that issue will get to the point where its owners think maybe it's worth running it for five or ten more years, and, and the proposition will get tested. But I don't think it's going to happen soon. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. comes back to my view that really the state the, if the state can't get drawn very far into that mode of thinking. That is, uh, if the commission starts saying, well, this plant's really, you know, here's a, here is a sensible system within which to make that decision. Uh, we're going to basically, if the plant stays as part of the regulated system, it's going to have to run against avoided costs in a PBR framework, uh, or else it's going to have to be divested as part of a general divestiture plan. Um, but, darn it, that puts cost pressure on the applicant, and boy, on them, that puts cost pressure on the owner, and boy, I'm just too worried about uh, 
that if we do that, there'll be an accident. That seems to be a real bad end for, uh, for regulators to, uh, to get drawn into it. It just seems to me to make a whole lot more sense to say, here's the framework. And by all means, go down to Washington, talk to the NRC commissioner, and say, here's what we're doing. Uh, and if that means you should have another resident inspector at, at the site uh, and pay some extra attention in the reviews for the next year or two, because it will create some pressures that aren't there now, uh, then the Atomic Energy Act makes nuclear safety yours preemptively. Um, we're restructuring in what we consider to be the best interests of, of our citizens, and we're letting you know that we, we that there's a possibility of increased pressure, and we expect you to do the job that the uh, uh, Act requires. And let us know if, in this framework we've set up, there's something we're unaware of that's producing uh, specific pressures that are contrary to safety that we wouldn't intend. But other than that, safety is your problem. Um, it seems to me to be the only way, uh, the only sensible way to uh, to get through this issue of the interplay between safety and, and restructuring is to be sure you're in close touch with the NRC, but don't take on the safety issue uh, within the state commissions because there's no one there qualified to do it. and the British have been doing it for the last few years, but somewhat informally. Uh, that is, as far as I know, there hasn't been that kind of communication between the state and the federal regulators. The cost pressures have been there, the, the, the sense among the power plant workforce that if the costs don't come down, this plant may not survive, uh, have certainly been there. Um, I'd say really only those two countries, though, because uh, I don't know of any others that are as far along, that have nuclear power plants that are as far along. Uh, actually, there, I, I should back off of that. There are a couple of the Latin American countries that are far along in restructuring. Argentina, for example, do have nuclear power plants, but I don't know how they treat it. Yes. a substantial difference in public perception uh, between the, the U.S. and <coughs> both France and Japan. And it's a pretty complicated history that uh, feeds into that. For example, uh, the, both the French and the Japanese systems are heavily centralized, the rate regulation is very much part of the, of the overall government apparatus, and as a result, to the extent there have been cost overruns, they have not shown up clearly and been equated with particular nuclear power plants the way they have in, uh, in this country. Also, both of those countries went to standardization much more heavily than we did. The U.S. system really for interesting historical reasons, but encourage uh, individual utilities to custom design their plants even while they were building them. And we had four reactor vendors basically improving their designs with each new reactor sale. The French, and the, the, the Japanese to some degree, the French to a very large degree, standardized heavily. And as, as a result, uh, a lot of the uh, need for individual regulatory attention that raised costs here didn't there. And so the whole hostility generated by the great increases associated with particular nuclear power plants is absent from uh, the history in, in, uh, in both those countries. Um, 
the licensing process is also somewhat different. In Japan, though, they've started to have a lot more trouble in the last three, four, five years with accidents, cover-ups. Uh, and I would guess if you had something that showed trend lines as well as just differences in opinion, you'd see some convergence between the nuclear negatives in the U.S. and nuclear negatives in Japan now. Um, it, uh, you know, beyond that, there are certainly cultural factors too, but I would say the biggest difference is in the, I would say, heightened awareness of the American public about the economic effects of particular plants. Those in the industry would probably say heightened hysteria or something like that, but it, uh, that's where the big difference is. Well, we're past 12, uh, so um, I guess you're all entitled to lunch. Thank you.